Hello, <coughs> in our discussion on different functions of management, we examined the organization theory, organizational development, the reasons for bringing about changes in the organization, in its technology, in its people, in its processes, the structure and any of these things we have seen it demands a good understanding of the individual behavior, the group behavior and the behavior of the organization as a whole. In our last lecture, we did examine several aspects of the group dynamics. Defending a group is an important aspect of the managerial effectiveness. Organizing the group to meet its set goals, integrating the people, creating that feeling of belongingness, creating the right climate and the structure and the culture all get supported through the group behavior and the leader group relations are seen as very critical in achieving the overall organizational effectiveness. So let us continue our discussion on the group dynamics. In the second part of my lecture, I intend to focus on the following things. The end of this session, you should have learnt and understood the following concepts. You should be able to talk about the group structure, the how the group size influences various aspects. We will also make some of the observation about the social density and then we will look at the group roles and the group norms. And while analyzing all these things, our focus is on how to improve decision making in the groups, how to increase belongingness in the group and also achieve greater satisfaction of the members through that we are improving the performance. So the performance and satisfaction is always is at the focus. When we see the group structure, see the work groups are not kind of an unrecognized mobs. They are not set of people just thrown in and so they do have to have a kind of a clear arrangement. So any group activity demands that somebody has to define the agenda, somebody has to direct the, the energy and the focus and the activities of the individuals and somebody has to manage the time and the resources. So we all know that the group need to have that kind of a structure that shapes members behavior. If it is not, then the members will act according to their convenience. So the group will not function, but there will, there will only be noise. So hence, it is always structure makes it possible to explain and predict a larger portion of individual behavior within the group. So it is extremely important to see how the structuring of the group, how this, how the activities have been grouped, regrouped within the group and how it is perceived, how it is allocated, how people understand and perform these. I think all these aspects become extremely important and the group structure becomes the basis of evaluating the roles, contributions and the behavior of the group members. It refers to the stable pattern of relationship. So the group structure provides that understanding among the group members. So that maintains the group and also helps it work towards its goals. So the structure is highly uh, influencing factor uh, about the goal and the goal uh, achievement. So the major variables defining group structure are the concept which we have to see are the, you know, along with that is the roles, group norms and the status. So the situational factor, sometimes the group size, the social density, the nature of the task and the kind of the context of the organization do influence group behavior. However, the structure need to be elaborated a little further, but we will also see the other aspects. The group size, if you see, the most visible factor influencing the group structure is the size of the group. The group size can vary according to many 
we can uh, vary from you know the diets of that is two people, the triads, the three, to a large as as high as about 200, 250 members. But when somebody thinks the group size is 250, then one can only assume that you will see many aspects of the crowd behavior, many aspects of clicks and things like that, and it is too large for any one person to handle, control, and give directions. So you will see many subgroups getting formed when somebody mentions the group size as 200 to 250. So what is then the ideal size? What is that best is going to happen? Several studies have indicated the group ideal size would be between 7 to 9. Group size 7 has emerged as a kind of a magic number and maybe up to 9 it is fine. But why do people think of the group size or the team size as uh, 7 or 9 is that when you look at a group size of 2 or 3, then there is not uh, many opportunities for people to learn from each other. Also, when you have to look at the idea generation, idea generation suffers in a group size of two or three, <coughs> but it increases substantially as we are seeing the group size reaching about seven and nine. But then if we keep on increasing the group size, then if you think of 11, 13, 15, and 18, then we will see that a small uh, noise is coming in the group. So that means in a, in a serious discussion, always about two or three, five people get neglected. And then they are not in a position to contribute within the given time. But when it increases beyond 30, then you will see that there are some people who will, who will relax, who will loaf around, who think that they are not part of any activity and things like that. So that is where the group size has been studied for its impact on the individual as well as on the performance of the group as a whole. So one of the more disturbing findings related to the group size is that as groups get incrementally larger, the contribution of individual members often tends to decrease. So that is where the individual uh, loafing, what people call it as a tendency on the part of the individual to become comfortable in the presence of others. So they think, yes, nobody is noticing them and they may or may not contribute. Who is bothered about? And these kinds of psychological thoughts do come when the group size becomes larger and that is the time where the individual is not participating actively and also thinks that he need not participate. So one of the important things the leader, the team manager has to look into is how to keep the team size as small as possible and also make sure that there is a direct observation, direct contact, direct dialogue is happening all the time between the leader himself and the subordinates or the group members. So the question is now to achieve that kind of an ideal size and whenever the small group you will see there are many tasks done by a two or three individuals. So that is the time where no doubt they work as a, as a set of members, but you may not see that feeling of belongingness, the feeling of different roles to be performed by different members, so that it loses some of the properties of the group. And that is the reason we are talking about the number of seven to nine. But the group size, if you see, the dispersion of responsibility within a group encourages individuals to slack off, slack off or that feeling of that loafing, feeling of non-responsibility has been an important thing to be bothered with the group size. So when managers use work teams, they should also provide means for identifying the individual efforts. So that means observation becomes extremely important. And that is how some of the people make a statement, in management, if you expect, things will not happen. But if you inspect, things will happen. So that is where the inspection role becomes more relevant, more important in a larger group uh, and with the size of anywhere between 20 and beyond. 
because the manager has to spend considerable time in observing the individual task, individual roles, things like that. So the size has to be understood in terms of what it, what impact it has on the members of the group and then group as a whole. And somebody is bothered about creating that kind of a team and team working, one need to sincere, sincerely see how to keep that size under control. But small groups provide each member with an opportunity to be actively involved in the group. So the size and participation, they go together. And the participation is the highest when it is about four, five, six, seven. But then as we mentioned earlier, the participation gets affected as the size increases. So this relationship when it is understood, we like to see how to put these groups in its practice. As group gets larger, so the participation declines and sometimes it declines rapidly. So that means one can see from 7 to 9 up to 15, it may decrease partially, but in a, in a rate which is not so high, but beyond 18 to 20, 25, it increases, the, but participation declines much more rapidly, but the larger the size, you know, then suddenly you will see several pockets in the group is not able to participate at all. So, in a, you know, an example is look at the class size, a small seminar with four or five students, yes, allows each student to participate because there is time available for everyone to discuss, ask questions, raise issues and things like that. But as we increase the group size or the larger class, there is not much of a chance. So somebody can sleep, somebody can, you know, can play in the sitting in the last uh, benches. So many of these things can happen in a large size uh, classes. So that as the size of a group increases, we will also see it affects not only the participation, but also the satisfaction because they are not able to participate, they are not able to contribute and so there is no recognition and things like that. So as the size of the group increases, the satisfaction of the group and their involvement in it also tends to, if you see, the, the increase up to a point, but then it, uh, it drops down as it happens in the, with respect to the participation. So the question is, the keeping this participation and satisfaction levels high and that is where it is extremely important to control, understand the size of the group. Size and performance is also linked. So the relationship between the group size and the performance also depends on whether the task is additive task, subjective task or disjunctive task. That means basically we are trying to bother about the the kind of relationships, the kind of understanding, the kind of task structure. So in a task structure where one has to do a thing and then next one can take over. So the additive task, the final group product is the sum of the individual contributions. And sometimes it is, it does not matter. You can do, you can have a little larger groups, but wherever the interaction is involved, interdependency is involved, the size and performance becomes extremely, the extremely relevant and the size uh, as it increases, then you know people are not in a position to tap on to each other, it affects the, it affects the overall performance. In fact, people have seen the, the kind of loafing tendencies gets increased and then over a period of time, these loafers who have a tendency to relax in the presence of others will become role models for others. And once they become role models for others, so the group also tends to see why, why do you work hard, why should you work, contribute and things like that. So there will be many group members who will be relaxing. I think this is what is called the also as the free rider tendency. So the reduction of effort that individual members contribute to the group as the group size increases is called the free rider tendency or also called as the social loafing. So one need to be bothered about how, how to understand this and how to 
correct this at an early stage, otherwise it becomes a kind of a group uh, norm and a group working and then it sets extremely bad uh, precedence. The other word which we talked about is the social uh, density. So, the so social density uh, is not that kind of a you know, very well studied variable, but many authors have mentioned but the concentration of people within an area is called the social density. So, that means within the same floor, within the same bay or within this uh, shop floor area whatever you can think of. So, it is measured by feet per person or the number of group members within a certain uh, walking distance. So, if they are, so if that means if it is too crowded, if there is not much of a space available then it does affect the quality of discussion, it also affects the, the thoughts, it also affects the performance, it also affects the satisfaction. Sometimes organizations also have found that social density improves group work because of greater accessibility. So, that means within the short range there are people are available so that they can go and meet with, but also it creates that noise, it creates that kind of a pressure. The next important thing is the nature of the task. So, the types of tasks have already been discussed when I said that is additive or conjunctive or disjunctive. So, the question is the need for coordination among the group members is much greater for conjunctive task and also for additive or you know than for this additive and disjunctive thing. So, when people have to work together and when people have to contribute, so then the coordination is, uh, is much, much higher level and then you will see how to, how to look into that. So, the group roles is another dimension of how the structure and functioning of the group happens. So, the roles have been defined variously. A role refers to the expected behavior attached to a position or also one can define it in a much more simpler fashion as a set of expectations. A set of expectations from the others defines the role of a particular person, particular position and the group roles are usually not explicitly stated, particularly in the informal groups. Informal groups develop some of these things over a period of time, but in the work group the roles are well defined and the role occupant knows from the day one what is to be done. So, the assigned roles are prescribed by a means of dividing the labor in the organization. So, that means the group itself has set of responsibilities. So, then you will see within the group how each one to work on and contribute. So, the questions are that the roles and role definitions are extremely important and then the methodologies of role and the role negotiations we will discuss as they contribute significantly to the performance as well as to the satisfaction. So, in any group you will see the one group may perform several roles or several members may exhibit the alternative performance. So, in other words in a group you will find the role and role performance could vary. Some roles some people are very effective. In some uh, groups, everybody can play every role and uh, in that means you know in terms of the role task and the roles, some tasks are very specialized kind of task which demands experience and expertise. Some tasks are routine and one can get on to those tasks in a much quicker fashion. So, the, the roles need to be seen in terms of the task and task itself is to be seen in terms of the expected preparation of to do that, that is required training, required experience, required expertise, etcetera. So, the, when you see the roles within the group, uh, so an individual is confronted by divergent role expectations, experiences what people call as the role conflict. So, the role conflict when different people demand different things. So, the divergence can come because of the quantity versus quality. 
use of some instrument versus the, the cost of uh, raw materials. So many people do not like to touch certain machines at all because somebody will ask an account or question who asked you to use such so much of costly material. So this has been seen in some of the government organizations where the, the, the copying machine is there but somebody is getting going to question you on about the use of the paper. So use of the paper make, makes another thing not to use the machine also even when it is required. So these are problems of where there are divergent kind of an expectations and the divergent role expectations brings that kind of a role conflict should I use or should I not use it? Should I do it now or should I do it later? So things like that. So the role conflict comes can come from because of the same person or because of different people. So it is called as the intra sender role conflict when it is the same boss talking about two different things at different points of time or colleagues and the boss is referred to as inter sender role conflict. So the intra and inter sender role conflict can could lead to the kind of the confusion in the individual. So as the role conflict increases, so you will see more and more uh, inaction amongst the group members. That means people do not take initiative, people do not make any contribution. And the other side, the apart from the role conflict, there, are, there could also be role ambiguity. When expectations are not very clear, when the details are not stated properly, the individuals experience this role ambiguity. So the role clarity versus role ambiguity need to be understood so that it is always better to provide that required role clarity about the means, about the ends, about the quality, about the quantity, about the task and the task in relation to the activities of other, the kind of challenge, the kind of improvements required, the kind of customers who are going to use it, the end product. So many of these things, if the role occupants know, then it is normally seen as or enabling the role, role, role performance and also contributing to the satisfaction of the member who is performing these roles. So usually in an organization, employees attempt to determine what behaviors are expected of them. So that means you know they try in different ways to know about it. So the employees would like to know what I am doing is correct, what I am doing is enough. So things like that. So it is extremely important that the group members sit together, discuss these things and the leader or the boss or the coordinator enables a, a good understanding of their role and the role expectation. So the role and expectation when we are seeing there are two different things. So the set of expectation is the, is the role of the individual. So we talked about the role conflict and the role uh, ambiguity, but there are also problems of role overload and role underload. So in any given group, the one of the difficulties is when there are few people that is you know two or three or four people in a group, then it always results in some kind of a role overload where the less number of people have to do more things and by chance if one or two members are not in a position to do certain things are not present or uh, take or doing something else usually it results as a kind of a pressure point for the existing members. So the role overload is one kind of a concept where there are too many expectations about the role occupant and the other side is the role underload. Role underload is a situation where members of the group feel that one should not be given any responsibility or they do not give the responsibility or they also think given the responsibility the individual may or may not perform or may mess up the whole thing. So any such perceptions and uh, such understanding amongst the group members result in the role underload and it can also come because of the poor attitudes of the individual where people do not take initiative, 
people do not or people are not involved, people are also called as psychological quits, that is the time where they, they, they reduce opportunities to contribute and perform and over a period of time when they keep on doing such things, experience this kind of a role under load. So, it is extremely important to look at the role conflicts, role ambiguity, role overload, role underload and the effort should be made to reduce the conflicts and increase that role clarity so that members can, can contribute. <coughs> but we are also talking about the work roles. So, here very clearly the, they are task oriented activity and the group defines these things in relation to the overall objective. So, the group members also link their roles to the overall performance and the objective. Wherever they see the roles are not so significant, roles are not so core to the performance, they may feel that they, that they are not doing something very significant. So, you can call it as a role significance or that identity which, which uh, the roles have also becomes very necessary, uh, necessary aspect of influencing the motivation of the members. So, the work roles, the include activities such as clarifying the purpose of the group, so the developing a strategy for accomplishing the work and then also delegating job assignment and also the evaluating the progress. So, whenever you see the, the definition of uh, work roles, one need to run through all these steps. So, clarifying it could be done in a very formal way where people sit and write down very clearly uh, for a new group member what is that you know individual is supposed to do. In a group where it is established over a period of time but you are looking for some change, very clearly one need to see and ask what is our group doing and how do you look at each one to be contributing. So, you may also question or get into that kind of a details of role definition and role negotiation. The, so, the work role is highly the task driven and task dependent, so that each task can need to be understood and, and then need to be integrated as a whole to meet those end tasks. So, the group task has to be seen one not only the work and work to be performed, but also there are maintenance roles. So, in any group somebody has to take care of the time, somebody has to take care of the social emotional aspect of the group functioning. So, that means it, it does not help for anything great, but it brings all the members together. It increases their involvement, it increases their the kind of a personal commitment. So, it acts as a kind of an emotional uh, thing where when some people walk in, so then you know you are asked them to you know take a chair or sit or a stand and then you know most of the things are that you are giving opportunity, you are asking people to, to see whether they have, they have followed or they have understood whatever is being discussed, asking some of these questions, providing clarifications, providing a two way kind of a dialogue explaining in different ways and then making people to work together, all these are part of this kind of a maintenance roles. So, these maintenance roles that encourages other members to participate, other members to praise, other members to reward each other, all these things will help, will help building the group, also will help in terms of the task facilitating set of members within the group has to do this and maintenance role typically run through supporting each other, then giving opportunities to everyone and then sometimes meeting and understanding how one feels about the individual activities as well as about the overall as about the task of what he is or she is doing and also to overall relationship between the task and the performance. So, the group roles you will see ideally a group leader can play both the roles. So, that means both the work roles and the task roles as well as this kind of a maintenance roles. 
so they enabling the group to perform with high degree of effectiveness. So the ideal situation is that the single leader will be you know the unable to perform both the roles equally well. So, in, so that means you need to identify someone else also to be performing. So some will focus on the work roles and then maybe request another one to focus on the emotional dimensions. The, the role related things also must be linked with respect to the group norms. Group norms refer to the commonly held beliefs of group members about the appropriate conduct. So norms are unwritten rules. It is not stated. It is evolved over a period of time. It is what people call it as customary practices. So the group norms are, are several things which influences the, the member and the member behavior and the way everybody does, but the you will see it is all unwritten, unwritten code of conduct. So all groups have established a kind of some norms or the other and you will also see uh, acceptable standards that are shared amongst the group members. So the group members know that it is not very obvious, but it guides their behavior, it influences their behavior. So these do's and don'ts, these unwritten norms gets developed over a period of time. So if you see the same members have met, let us say that over, a, over, over the years, 2 years, 5 years, 10 years, 20 years, if the set of people have worked together, then you must assume that norms are, are very well set. So do's and don'ts are well established. And in a new group, norms are so well, well matured or, you know. The question is that somebody is interested in managing change, somebody who is interested in moving the group, so in a group which has history, history of interaction, one has to make an assumption that there are many do's and don'ts in the group. But in a new group, you can always evolve some new standards, new acceptable or non-acceptable kind of behaviors. So the group norms, the, it dictate things like output levels, absenteeism, uh, the late coming, the promptness, the tardiness and many other things. So the question is the amount of socializing allowed on the job. So for a newcomer to a group, you know, talking on the job uh, while they are doing things, exchanging notes, it may be look, they look as prohibitive or it is silly or one should not be doing and things like that. But the group members have done this over a period of time, then the, it is the way that is how they think it should be handled or it should be done. The similarly about the late coming, you know, in some groups coming late is highly acceptable because unless somebody, you know, everyone comes in, they really do not bother about the time and uh, they think that initial time is to warm up and spend some time. But in many, in other group coming at the right time is seen as an important norm and people get agitated if the, if the meeting is not starting at the, at that particular time. And similarly, somebody is coming or not coming. In some groups may be viewed as very seriously and many groups it may not be so viewed very seriously. And similarly, the, the supply of or the, you know, the material whenever it is to be given, you know, the, the giving late it is acceptable but certain, so it is a part of that culture which is, which gets developed into this norms or norms define over a period of time the culture of the group is a matter of details and the debate. Group norms identify the standards against which the group members will be evaluated and also they help the group members know what they should and what is that they should not. So in many times you will see that some kind of a discomfort in the group because you as a newcomer may be violating the group norms or you are questioning some of the group norms. 
and when people are used to set of comfort by establishing some relaxed norms, then it also becomes questioning some of their rights, some of their privileges or some of their comfort levels. So you will see some norms turn from sheer practicality, you know that is how they are used to. In one factory, the people would come and then they will punch their cards and there used to be a temple, so they will go to the temple, visit all those and then there is also a canteen on the way, so they will go and spend some time in the canteen and then they come back to the, come to the workplace. So that means they may take anywhere between 40 to 45 minutes as a kind of a set up time. But this was allowed for years. So sometimes it is also seen in terms of some norms extend to the preserving the social hierarchy. So they wait for some senior to come and then only they can enter and start their work. So it is, so there is all of the group members are supposed to come and wait for the leader to come and the leader has the resource, leader has the permission to tell others to start and so people wait for some the senior most person or the leader to come. So you will see that if you listed all the it can be the kind of the all the organizations of the group so can follow this or need not follow this. So the norms endanger some practice and at the same time may serve to make the group long lived. So that means it also helps if somebody does not like such kind of a behavior or cannot be a part of such things, usually they leave. So in a group where the mostly the leader speaks and the members have not much of an opportunity to practice or the, you know, the practice of questioning many things and simply they are accepting and into that group if somebody comes and opens, it becomes uh, a behavior which is non-acceptable. So if one or two times it is fine, but later on such behaviors are questioned, the person may leave because he thinks or he may think that such norms of non-participation is not acceptable to him. So the, so it also gets into the norms to the cultural and food restrictions are very good examples of this. So some people do not like to become part of the group because they do not like certain practices certain food or certain arrangements or certain activities of the group which is driven by its norms which are acceptable or developed over a period of time. You can also see within a group of engineers, it may be an office norm that you know engineers who perform the majority of the initial project should give the presentation. So in other words, who did the, all that work and who put all the thought, I think they are asked to but it is not asked, the group projects or group presents that person to go and make a presentation. But then the such a norm might support right, optimal resource deployment. So it is sometimes it is good that somebody has worked, somebody has uh, done that homework, he or she should go and make a presentation. But if somebody can also question this, so if the engineer is asked not to follow this norm, and then suddenly you ask somebody else to make a presentation, you as a new group manager, so suddenly you will find that it leads to the anxiety. It does not only the anxiety to that person whom you have asked, but the person who has prepared and who is expecting that, that he or she is going to do that job also gets into that anxiety, why I am not writing or uh, why I am not presenting. So the norms why you know it is essentially what happens is it might be used as a kind of vehicle of judgment of uh, what is acceptable and what is not acceptable, what is desirable and what is uh, not desirable in terms of the performance. And you will see the norms simplify things, they serve the belonging needs we all have, so it provides that kind of a basis, it provides a kind of an order which members are very comfortable with. Usually the newcomer or the stranger to the group finds it as silly or sometimes he thinks why this is how, what this, how, why this should be done in this way. So they can be used as a kind of a, many a times as a kind of very ready reckoner 
so with which the behavior is checked, so in a norm thing, so if some youngster is able to do the things, you accept that all others also can do. So it simplifies the coming to some kind of a judgment as well. So when an individual does not conform to the group norms, so the other members of the will group will try to persuade him or her. And this can be seen when people try to communicate through their eyes, I think this is not acceptable behavior. Sometimes people also communicate through verbal modes. So sometimes they may also shout at the other or sometimes also they get into the physical abuse of who asked you to do and things like that. So they will try to reason with, with the deviant or make that kind of a pointed jokes so that they can correct. So that means the group creates its own mechanism of enforcing the norms. Group uh, punishes those people who violate the group norms and the group also encourages the conformity and the compliance to the expected norms and it can be done in many ways through, through verbal behavior, um, through non-verbal behavior and also through many systematic use of some kind of the implicit or explicit punishment and the reward system. So the group norms are typically created and enforced for four reasons. First of all, they facilitate group survival. It, it makes sure that the members are remaining with the group. And also they simplify the requirement and make the behavior of uh, group members more predictable. So that means it brings that kind of an order. It, it uh, helps people to see what is, exp you know, what is desirable and otherwise. So simply by following those things, they get that feeling of belongingness and the comfort. They also help the group to avoid an embarrassing situation. So that means they know that by doing certain things that they may hurt or they may create awkward situations. And they also express these norms, the central values of the group. So that means they know that by doing this, there are that they are the part of this group. So this gets expressed in many ways. So normally the accepted norms are stated as a kind of a social conduct. So the social conduct norms are designed to create a kind of a present social atmosphere. So what is this pleasant social atmosphere get defined by the group in various ways. It uh, depends upon the, the context and the situation. So it could be in terms of the, the such as smiling when you pass a friend. So uh, then you know you are saying hello or uh, wishing a goodbye or the inquiring and some of these things. So if group norm is that if you do not spend that few minutes, that is seen as a very uh, 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 most unacceptable behaviors in certain contexts in certain groups. So it is extremely important to spend that time. Maybe in another group saying hello and talking little more is seen as a waste of time. So that means you are a lazy person, not only you are wasting your time, but you are also wasting the time of the others. So the question is how you, what do you do after saying hello or after you are saying goodbye and uh, things like that. And these are more driven by that kind of a norms of where you see a respecting and uh, or wasting time. And particularly also you will see the dress codes. So many organizations specify this today formal uh, dress standards. So the members such as, you know, for example, very clearly you see in the military, the police, hospitals, restaurants, so hotels. So the many of the places have very clearly the dress codes. The dress codes are, are today very well accept, accepted kind of a practice. It indicates the kind of uh, profession they are belonging to and also provides a kind of a basis of their uh, behaviors as well. But the dress code in the organization also can be defined as what is formal and what is informal, what is acceptable and what is not acceptable. Today many colleges are defining their dress codes. 
many schools say very clearly that these, uh, these are, this is how uh, something to be followed and certain dress codes are not acceptable. So, the, you know, the, the dress codes what we are talking about is organization may not be quite as official and uh, there may not be anything in written form, but nevertheless so the dress norms may be uh, just as powerful. So somebody wearing, you know, wearing a very strong color, somebody not wearing the tie and the jacket, somebody not wearing, so in some group it is seen as, uh, as insulting, somebody is not wearing an appropriate color or somebody wearing a multi print and multi color kind of a thing. So it, it can create a kind of an awkward feeling in the or amongst the members of the group. So they will may think the same member who is to be regular, who is to wear some, some uh, normal thing, but just because he is wearing something else may be seen as a crazy or also may be asked to go home and you know, change the dress and come back. I think this is where the unwritten rules of the game influences the, the behaviors of the members. The performance norms are also another uh, thing. So it is the particularly the speed, how fast the group members are expected to work and how much they should uh, produce are uh, another, uh, you know, if you see important issues. In, uh, in many organizations, the group members would have defined what is the ideal uh, work for the day. So they would define this is if they do this kind of an output and that is good enough. So in other words, the work standards gets modified, gets defined, gets redefined by the group members. And then anybody violating this, violating this in a minor way or in a serious way gets punished by the, by the group members. So that means they may perceive it as that you are taking away someone else, else's work or you are trying to impress the management by doing some extra thing. So they may perceive as, as what people call as an apna or a pariah. So you may be seen as a kind of a pariah to the group because you are violating that expected uh, performance uh, standards. So the group enforces that what is good and what is necessary. So therefore, the kind of performance norms you know, the, the created by the group, they guide that individual efforts. So the performance norms can be very, very frustrating to managers because they do not understand why with all care, with all effort, the group is not able to give more. So the norms may be very inconsistent with the organizational goals. So the kind of education, the kind of training, the kind of inputs, the kind of new technology all gets modified by these group norms. So they, unless the managers see why people have thought about these as norms and what, what is that they consider as the ideal day's work, not only as an individual but as a, as a group, they will not be able to break that kind of a, a barrier which comes in the way of performance. So the norms in relation to the performance has to be well explored and it is best done by the group itself to, to encourage norms which guide good performance and also discourage such practices which comes in the way of time management, which comes in the way of individual development, which comes in the way of creating energy and focus of the members to achieve the task. So it is good to explore these things by the group member and then the leader should, uh, should encourage this. And also the reward allocation norms. The group also develops norms of governing how reward should be distributed and uh, how, the, how people must be recognized both for their individual and the, and the group performance. So when typical example could be when there are about 10 drivers of different age groups and different experience and if they also have 10 vehicles. So when the new vehicle comes, 
the question was who should drive that. So that is where when a driving a new vehicle is seen as a kind of a reward, not just by the task. So then the group will see who should drive that. Is it the most experienced person or is it the youngest person or is it the person who is having uh, the, the, you know, the safety record, who should do this? So the reward allocation norms also get developed by the members of the group. Most of the time it is the discussion around the seniority versus merit and the typically the seniority age gets uh, its acceptance in most of the work groups. So the question is the allocation norms have been investigated to determine so which norm is most widely accepted. So studies have indicated that typically the group would like to accept the criteria which is verifiable, which is acceptable to all people. So the norms of uh, equality suggest that everyone should be treated in the same fashion. So the norms of equity uh, suggest that the reward should be allocated according to the contribution of the group to the product. But most of the time the group would like to have okay, divide everything you know, across. So the group members do not like to be differentiated. But in some of the cultures, the group demands that the individual contribution be identified. Individual should be differentially rewarded. So the question is what are the norms and then unless you change the norms, unless you change this norms at the group level, you cannot bring about change in the organizational culture. And similarly the norms of social responsibility suggest that the reward should be allocated on the basis of the need. So sometimes the group would like to say okay so and so requires more money, so and so is in need of that and gives such facilities or so the norms of the group can be linked to the need, can be linked to that collegiality, norms also can be linked to the individual hard work and contribution. So the group can use and define these things and once such things are practiced, people also support such practices. And also the norm of reciprocity, the way the norms of this reciprocation suggests that when people make an effort to help you, you should uh, feel an obligation to help them at a later point of time. So that means you have taken some obligation or you are under the obligation to someone because of the help they have given to you. So the reciprocity principle also brings that the group understands who has contributed more at some point of time, who has been deprived of the reward. So it gets corrected at a, at a later point of time. So far we have discussed these aspects with the, what the group structure, the group size, the social density, the group roles and the group norms. All these variables of the group they are highly interrelated. As we have seen the size influences the role and role performs, the norms influence the the structuring of the group and the allocation of the task. Similarly, the, the density influences some of the behaviors. In the next lecture, we will explore the dimensions of the, the group in relation to conformity, compliance, identification and also the, the group uh, composition. And the effects of groups on uh, individual behavior. You will also see the social uh, facilitation. You will also examine some dimensions of the de-individuation.